The Keshe Foundation is um, uh, it's been established to look after all the interests of whatever is developed by me and all the developments of the present and the future will belong to the foundation. And the Cash Foundation is based in Holland and it's been set up in the past five years for mainly to protect the intellectual rights and the financial rights of all the inventions and the patents and any literature which is written within the, about the development of the space technology by Cash Foundation or by me as a person and whatever will be developed in the future by within the Cash Foundation. Oh, we developed a lot of things. Um, it is some 40 odd years of research and development. We have changed the course of the space technology where we have made the uh, use of the propulsion obsolete. There is no need for burning fuel the way it's done with the rocket propulsion. We don't see such a thing in the universe. And then we have developed, or well, we are in the process of developing, a one unified medical application, which means one system to see that it can treat all sorts of uh, uh, diseases, cancer, FMS, MS, and all sorts of kind of things. The other side is the development of the materials. We have developed totally new materials, unknown, uh, like uh, CO2 in a solid state at room temperature, and other hand is the development of new energy systems where you can produce as much energy as you need on demand with a very simple system where it makes the uh, human race independent of burning fuels. And all these things are not talk, we have systems, we show them and we are developing more and more new systems to make them much easier to be achieved. My name is Mehran Tabakuli Kesh. So I am the founder of the foundation, or Stichting. And I have developed the whole technology from basics of the understanding the new concept of creation of gravity and magnetic field of the Earth. And over some 20, 30 years, have found parallel applications in medical and different part of the science for the same discovery. The main problem in the world of science was that nobody could understand how gravitational fields are created. So over 30 years of research, we have understood how gravitational systems within a system like Earth is done. And we made the systems replicate the conditions and we achieved the same uh, characteristics of the, as the Earth, which is a system which holds gravity and the magnetic field at the same time. So we brought the technology and the knowledge into the world of uh, medical application and we've seen how easily certain diseases which have been a big problem for the world of science can be reversed or can be helped to be um, re reprocessed as we call it. We brought the same thing to the other side of material and the energy we see the same operation. The reason that um, you say that no other scientists have to reach to such a point is that a lot of scientists around the world are working to this target. But uh, somehow, over working on this um, principle for some over 30 years, 40 years, it was uh, bound for somebody to get there first. And we look at, and as it is, we are the first to have done that. Americans are running a very small pro program, or they run a program in 2005 under a M2P2. They call Mini Magnet Sphere System which was done in Washington University. And Americans, other universities have looked such a thing. But we are the first organization which actually can produce a physical system to show the whole operation. The system can be used for different applications. Most of the things which we, we thought is impossible in the universe or to be produced, now we understand how gravity and magnetic field can be produced at the same time in the same system it is easy to produce. It's easy to produce uh, protein out of the fresh air, as you call it, or to produce energy out of a very small system, which can give a few kilowatts or a few thousands of kilowatts at the same time from the same system. The breakthrough comes in understanding how to produce magnetic and gravitational field as a plasma at the same time, in the same system, in the same part of the same system. 
The problem with the world of science has been is that over centuries we saw the effect of magnetic field of the Earth, we call it our atmosphere, or we call it magnetosphere of the Earth. And centuries later, Newton understood the property of gravity, or he explained gravity. If the scientific world or man at the same time would have discovered that the gravity and the magnetic field at the same time wouldn't have been in this dilemma which we are at the moment, that we think gravity is a mm, holy grail of the science. Gravity and the magnetic fields are created by the same material in the same place in every dynamic system, be it Earth, be it Sun, be it air, even a galaxy. So, what happens in reality is magnetic fields, or what you call magnetosphere of the Earth, is created by the repulsion forces of the field. And the attraction forces are gravity, or they get gravitated. It's like when you have a solid magnet. In a solid magnet, you have a north and south. When you have a north and south, they get attracted. That's gravitation. And when you have north and north, they repel each other. So that becomes the magnetic field or repulsion force. In a plasma, or in the plasma of a proton or an electron, the same thing happens, but in a spherical shape. A dynamic magnetic field, they create magnetic field and gravitational field at the same time. So every object which has got a dynamic magnetic field is always a spherical. We don't see cylindrical objects in the universe which have the gravity and magnetic field. Through the properties of reconnection of magnetic fields, you find uh, most of the objects are spherical, and being a spherical, they in turn have fields which they interact and they have gravity and magnetic fields. So, what we call magrav is the basis of it. What they call anti gravity is a nonsense. There's nothing called anti gravity. And at the same time, you cannot have gravity and have not have a, a magnetic field or we call a magnetosphere. So, the two are always together. One is the repulsion and one is attraction. And the systems which we have developed and tested confirms the correctness of theory. The way we have uh, found how we can use this knowledge in the medical application is that as a scientist, as a physicist, I treat the body as a galaxy. In understanding how uh, matters, like what we call as matters or entities like Earth or Sun operate within a galaxy, and why they have certain positions and the position don't change. The same thing happens in a smaller scale in the atoms and molecules which they make the cell of the human being. If you understand the concept of creation of magnetic field and gravitational field, and how they position uh, themselves in respect to each other, and how the matter or entity which has both positions itself in respect to the other of the same, then you can go into dimensions of uh, uh, body, treat the body as a galaxy, then you can allow the body to re go back and reset itself to the position as it was before an illness sets in. So the systems we make is rigid, uh, rigid and is a copy of the body. The body of the person is flexible, so it tries to go back to its origin. So that's how a lot of illnesses can be help to be recycled, what we call it. We don't call it treating, we don't call it curing. It's setting the body back to its original position, or we call processing it. This technology on the medical side has been tested from 2004-2005, and at the moment we are running some 30-40 trials, literally around Europe, America, uh, Canada, Middle East, uh, Far East, and uh, in Belgium, in Holland, in, Ge in uh, England. And we are learning that, and we are getting to the point that we can make one system to be able to um, be programmed to reset any body, any physical body, from any illness. And uh, the signs are that we are very correct and uh, the process is still going on. I am born in a house where radiation was part of the bed and breakfast. It was part of the food of the family. My father was part of the 
Philips International in medical x-rays. So I was introduced to the world of um, radiation at a very young age, seeing operation of the x-ray machines and everything else. And then I went to England to study as a um, nuclear engineer, uh, graduate from Queen Mary College as a nuclear engineer, specialized in uh, reactor system control and technology. I could not see any future for what I wanted to do within the industry, so I worked independently financing the technology and at the same time researching it. And since 2002, more or less full time, I spent on development of the technology. But it's been a long haul process. We have communications from 14th of June, two th sorry, 14th of June 1985 with NASA, where we proposed this technology. And uh, we have um, developed the technology over years in stages, but in past five or six years has gone totally in a very meteoric uh, scale up that we are literally developing everything and different aspects of the technology on a daily basis. The whole of science will change f from what we know in one way or another in a very near future. As I gave a presentation to scientists in um, institute or organization known as IMEC in 2005, uh, a scientist who was part of the directors of one of the subsidiaries of this establishment, he was walking in the room, up and down. We asked him, why are you pasting? He said, we were talking recently that very soon somebody will discover how gravity is done and the whole ball game changes. And now this guy is here and explaining it how it's done. You have to understand that this technology has been evaluated by University of Brussels, Flemish side, VUV, by Professor Van Avermeer initially for the assessment for the Flemish or Belgium uh, federal or governmental side of the aerospace. And they said initially, yes, the technology is correct in feasible, it's feasible that it produces energy. Then the technology was assessed by independent um, commercial entity to see if it can, a copy can be made. And they said, yes, it can be done. Then uh, we start building prototypes, different prototypes over four or five years. And then uh, we saw the first lifts in Belgium in mid 2006, 2006, 2007, it was carried on. And in 2008, with the invitation from the Iranian government, we built the first proper gravitational external movement in Tehran, which has been tested. And now the system is very floating and we can fly, we can move any movement we like. And as we have said very recently at the Cash Foundation Forum, if the Russian Space Agency and the American NASA Space Agency will not be able to assist their um, astronauts, which, is, uh, which are in the space lab, as the Americans don't have any more space program till 2020, and the Russian rocket has recently exploded, they are not launching anything till they find out what's happening, we are so advanced that we are prepared to intervene and if need be to bring the astronauts back and we are preparing ourselves for such a demonstration. We have shown the system to the scientists at University of Kent, they have seen the physical um, system. We have shown the videos of the weight reduction and lift to the scientists and officials from the Belgian government and within the Belgian structure. Uh, in past three years they know exactly what it stands. The Americans know what it is there and the, with the Canadian government when they arrested me in Canada last year for 11 days, they have downloaded the whole thing. They know it's very true and very correct because in the package of the documents they downloaded and they copied, there are videos of the lift and weight reduction. They know it's correct and it's a copy of what was developed in Tehran. And uh, why did they uh, capture you or like what were they looking for? Uh, nobody knows how. The reason that I was arrested on board of a plane on a transit from Brussels to Mexico City uh, on transit in Toronto airport, nobody knows. I was interrogated at one stage or 
two days, three days, up to 12 uh, agents and scientists at the same time in the airport of uh, Toronto Airport from 9 o'clock in the morning till walk on 1 o'clock the next day on three days con consecutive days and they've copied everything in my suitcase in my dossier which I was carrying as a scientific trip and uh, they were so stupid that they left some of their papers and their documentation they were in such a hurry to copy in my suitcase so when I returned I opened my suitcase because they just received me on the plane back to England to Belgium uh, and we put all the documents on the internet so uh, all the Canadian government document officials copying my things uh, all the bags what they had in their hand keys uh, what do you call it um, internet keys um, hard disks how many hard disks they, they stole they copied everything it's all on the internet we actually got a physical left all their documents saying certified that my passport, all my documents are carried as correct, it's all is in our hand and the opposition. But like, uh, aren't there like a lot of people who have like problems with you or like the way uh, you're going to handle things or it's against their business as well? We don't have problem with nobody. The, the thing is, uh, as um, American naval officer, high-ranking officer told me in Seoul, in the Hamilton Hotel in 2008, when they asked me to attend a meeting to see their officials, uh, they said the problem with me is that I don't talk. As a scientist, I'm not a theoretical physicist. What I talk, I make system that shows the reality of what I talk. I'm an engineer. So when I think of something, I can physically make the system and show it. And this is the problem with what I do. When I say we can lift, we understand the gravity and magnetic fields, we build a system to prove the technology. I build everything physically from A to Z and then we test it and it works. It's the same what we've done with uh, medical applications. In 2008, when there was a girl in coma in a hospital in Belgium, when we said we can bring her out of coma, when she was in Glasgow 3, which is literally a heartbeat, there was no brain activities, the doctors called me a charlatan. Within seven days, the girl recognized the mother, recognized the father, recognized the family, and by Belgian law, the machine should have been turned off by 6th of May 2009, because the body was dead. The girl is alive. She's been tested by scientists at Liège University, with a collaboration from scientists from Cambridge University and scientists from Israel to confirm that she's fully conscious, she recognizes the whole condition and we have videos of it which has been sent to us by the mother to confirm it was the right decision for us to allow a body, a human being to live and not to be killed by present knowledge in the world of science. The reason why we got in developed, I pushed ahead with the medical application of the technology is that we are very much running operation parallel or the same or any operation a space technology development organization does as we do. NASA does the same. Russian space agency does the same. Iranian space agency does the same. The Chinese space agency does the same. Is that we try to cover all aspects of it. The medical, the food, the energy for space, and lift and motion. So, for me, has been the point that we cannot take all the medicine to space. We cannot take all the doctors with us to space. There will be more medicine than cargo to cover the headaches, the migraine attacks, the heart attacks, and there'll be more doctors than the astronauts to do the heart operation if somebody goes sick or to, God knows, do an amputation or whatever comes up. So the whole concept is that we are making one system in the space. We do not need, even if we come in touch with new diseases and germs, we can't fly all the way back to Earth for somebody done a clinical trials for 10 years to see what the results are. All diseases are energy-based, are magnetic field-based, and they are magnetic, plasmatic magnetic field-based. So now we're developing one system that in a space we don't need to carry any medicine. And that's the whole objects of the production of getting involved in the material side of the medical application. We are not in competition with pharmaceuticals. Our objectives are space only. So we're developing a technology where in a space one system can handle 
most and all the diseases known and to be come across in the space for us. Space is full of viruses. So, it's the same with the food production. We cannot carry food. At the moment, the Americans are planning 20, 22 miles, 22 months travel. They have to foresee every drop of water that the astronauts or the pilots or whatever, passengers of these systems will drink every food they might consume. Now we have developed a technology that we don't even need to carry to food because we can use this process of the cycling of CO2 from the human body to give body enough energy and food that they can travel to deep space without depending on food from base which is Earth. The same is with the energy. Energy process at the moment, they talk about solar cells and all sorts of things. In deep space there is no solar energy and light. So, but the space is full of residual magnetic field of operations of the bodies like the Sun and other galaxies. So we developed a technology where we can absorb all these minute energies and collect them and turn them into light or energy for lighting. And we show this with a torch system which we have shown before. And that's another process that we, being independent from Earth, for supply. The same goes with feeding people. People are used to eating solid food, so we had to face in recent past that we have to produce something solid at the digestion system, otherwise it bleeds if you don't feed it. So we use the CO2, we have developed a technology where we can produce CO2 as a solid at room temperature. It's never been known. They said this is crazy, cannot be done. The material has been tested by the scientists at Ghent University. We have published in the second book all the documents, all their finding, all the graphs of the um, infrared and the spectroscopies to confirm this is a new material. And in reality, if you tell me what is a CO2, how can a gas be solid state at the room temperature, it's impossible. We always say a very simple thing. Just pinch your own body, pinch your own skin, pinch your own flesh. What is it made of? Amino acids, nitrogen, hydrogen, carbon, and oxygen. You should be a floating balloon. Why are we solid? Because up to now, we never understood the real forest, fourth state of matter. We are made of gases, so we should be a balloon. And we are not, because we are, we are solid. And how this solid comes to be, is that this is what we call the real fourth state of matter. All the matters, solid, gas and liquids, are externally affected, environmental effects on the matter. But now that we understand the creation of gravity and magnetic fields, we understand that if you change the parameters internally of the elements, the magnetic field or gravitational field, you can achieve a solid state at any temperature, any pressure, anywhere in the universe. So, in fact, on Earth, these gases, when they come together in a certain combination, at a certain vacuum condition of the body, they change themselves to solid state. That's why it's our meat, this is our flesh. And we've shown this for the first time. In fact, I can show you a CO2 in a liquid form. This is a CO2. We don't say it has been tested by the scientists in Ghent University. And funny enough, as I explained to you, that I was arrested by the Canadians. Canadians have literally tested every single tube which was with me. The black markings are the gift of the Canadian government. And then they said they'll give me the report on it, and then they classified the report because it was too hot to release. So, in a way, this is a CO2 in a liquid form, and it shows it's at room temperature, at room temper uh, pressure. So this is exactly how every human body is. Uh, and in fact... It's also closed. When you put off the capsule, I saw it was also closed. Huh? What do you mean? It's, no, it's open. Is it? So, oh, bizarre. Yeah. Really and at the same time, if you can process it further, this is CO2, solid state. But in this needs a lot of processing to go from uh, liquid to solid. But now, in a very easy way, if you want to see, 
This is a methane gas, methane gas in a solid state. And you can see the methane gas in a liquid state. And this is literally, that's what we call uh, CH4. These things have a lot of applications. And if you look at the CO2 in a liquid state, it's very much the color of the brain of the human. This allows us to build next generation of computers. This is a nano-state material of the gas, what we call GANS, which is gas at nano-state. This allows for the next generation of the computers, which are not connection-dependent. We don't see wires in the brain of human being. It's the way the nanomaterial communicate and connect with each other. Now we can build the next generation. We are in that process. Because when we go to space, and with the space technology we developed, I can, when I can go faster than the speed of light, which is very, uh, very soon it will be shown it can be done, because Einstein said E is equal to mc squared. And it cannot go faster than the speed of light. You cannot go faster than the speed of light in a matter environment. If you can break into the magnetic fields which are above matter environment, you can go at any speed, hundreds and thousands of times faster than the speed of light. I have explained this in the two books I published, and it's been um, published in the past 12 months, 18 months. So, uh, in a way, we've broken from the taboo of Einstein that we cannot go faster than the speed of light. Because, in fact, when you create magnetic field and gravitational field at the same time, the speed of light becomes irrelevant as your mass is independent. What does this mean? For example, as you create magnetic and gravitational field at the same time, all you need to do, you keep the mass the same of your aircraft, you tune to the magnetic and gravitational field the strength of, let's say, Mars. You don't need any fuel. The gravitation of the Mars will pull you much faster than anything that you can spend with rocket fuel or a propulsion to get there. Americans are planning a seven-month trip to get there with a gravitational system which we developed. We're talking 24 hours, 48 hours return trip because it's not that it's impossible. If you listen to the uh, broadcast or the publication which has been put out by NASA, they're expecting to go to Moon in 2015, which is another 40 years from now, within four hours and that's ex accepting propulsion plasma. We are doing the same thing, but we use the propulsion magnetic field positioning, what we call gravitational positioning, and it's very simple. We don't burn any fuel. The time of burning fuel is finished. There is no time to burn fuel. In the universe, we don't see Earth, which has been going around for some billions of years and is going for another billions of years. Every now and then, a fuel tanker comes and fuels the Earth. This doesn't happen. Earth creates magnetic fields and gravitational fields at the same time, and that, the two together, finds its position in respect to the Sun, so it keeps its distance. And the same combination, it gives Earth the speeds of its rotation and its position while it's traveling. If you ask a lot of people at the moment, what's the fastest you ever traveled, they tell you maybe a jumbo jet. 900, 1,000 kilometers an hour. Unless you've been astronaut, you've done a 40,000 kilometer an hour. But if you look at the reality, all of us and all our ancestors, from the time the Earth has been created, we've all been traveling faster than Concorde and anything else at 1,600 kilometers an hour. That's why we have the 24 hours. The Earth rotates on its axis 1,600 kilometers an hour plus. It hasn't changed. We don't see any wings on the side of the Earth, and we don't see any rockets and propulsion that determines it, because we got enough satellites. We looked at it. But at the same time, the same planet rotates as 100,000 kilometers an hour around the Sun. Again, we don't see any rocket propulsion. Why? How it works? In the universe, everything works on the positioning of magnetic fields. And then they say, the solar system itself is traveling within its galaxy at one million kilometers an hour, or the whole universe is working by one million plus kilometers an hour. So, in reality, 
the time and the space of the speed is totally dependent on how and what strength magnetic field in respect to the position you are or you want to be, you create and generate. So the theory of E is called MC squared is totally out of the window. It's not out of the window, but in fact, it's only applicable to Earth magnetic fields. The other breakthrough with this technology has been, which is very interesting, is that if you ask any theoretical nuclear physicist, what is an electron? Ask any physicist, what is an electron? What is inside an electron? They cannot answer you. They say, we don't know. But we know it rotates and flies around its center of the proton at a high speed. When you look at the um, atom on the um, equipment which are available at the moment, you see a fizzy light. That's how we know what an electron is. But if you ask, what is inside the pro uh, electron? They say, we don't know. It's very simple. For the first time, we have explained electron is a plasma and it's got exactly the same content as a proton which is in the center. If you think it's a bit funny, it's not acceptable, it's very simple. We say in the nuclear physics and in nuclear industry, when a neutron divides, it makes an atom which is actually a proton and its electron. And ask yourself very simple, if you have a bottle of water and you put three quarters of it in one glass, and you put another quarter of it in another glass, what is in the smaller portion? Exactly what was in the main ingredient, it's the same water. So, electron is a plasma, but in a smaller quantity than this proton. So for the first time we can explain that electron is a plasma. And we use this property in our space technology. When we want to lift heavy masses, we use the plasma of the electron. We know how to strip it, we know how to open it. And when we want to lift heavier masses, we use the magnetic field, which is within the plasma. But we've gone a step further. The step further is that what we call plasma technology. Plasma technology has been made a lot of. But in fact, if you open the plasma itself, you find out matter, which is what is tangible, is that the end of the magnetic field spectrum. There are higher energetic, stronger magnetic field within the center of the plasma of a proton, for example, where as it unwinds and it slows down in its strength, it becomes matter. So, in fact, we have opened the plasma of electron, we go to its center, to its creator of all where all the energy is released from. We call it the principal matter because that is where everything starts from. It's the principal energy source and principal magnetic field source. Um, the scientific world would like to call it antimatter, and there are very funny things that's been said. They said if the matter and antimatter hit each other, there'll be nothing left, some magnetic fields. But in reality, it's like saying if Earth hits the Sun, there'll be nothing left of the Sun, because Earth is a very small piece in the whole of the solar system, and the Sun is the center. So, in reality, what they say, uh, matter and antimatter, uh, is, is nonsense because, in fact, we call it the principal matter as this very strong magnetic field center unwinds like a literally like a, a clock of springs. If you remember when you were young, you play with it, you wind it. As he opens up and then releases it in his magnetic field, over billions of the years, this entity exists in the universe. So, as it becomes weaker, it becomes matter at this lower end of a strength. At the highest strength, because it's so high, we don't see it, but we know of its existence because it guarantees the existence of the proton and the electron or the atom for billions of years. So what we do, we open the plasma, we go to the source, and when we're finished we're using its magnetic fields, we don't burn it, we put it back together again. So when we go to the center of the plasma, we open the plasma, we use this magnetic field, and we use it for positioning, then we get where we want or we achieve what we want, then we then put it back together, we don't burn it. In fact, it's very simple to understand. If you will remember from your child time in the school, they always told you two magnets. If you put two magnets, I try to show it to you here if it can be seen. If you put north and north or south and south facing each other, the other magnet moves away. It's a very small movement, but moves away. You can do it at home. And if you put north and south together, they're attracted. The interesting thing is, if you put south and south together, the other magnet moves away. You've seen it. 
there is no engine, there is no rocket in any of these two matters. It's positioning. They position each other in respect to each other. So what happens? Without any rocket propulsion, the other magnet moves to find its position comfortable in respect to each other. This is what we call magnetic positioning. And when you bring this into a plasma condition with a spherical shape, because in the universe, as I said, we don't see um, cylindrical matters, we don't see hexagonal matters. Everything is spherical. This is a spherical magnet. This is how the universe is. It has to close itself. So, in a way, I can show you very simply how the matters are in the universe. It's very simple. This is a four magnetic rings, one in the center and four around it. If one of these moves in any direction, the other one moves with it, without actually doing anything, because they have to find each other's position. They have to find where they are comfortable to be in respect to each other. When one moves, the other matter has to position itself to it. This happens exactly if you bring this knowledge back into medical application, which we talked earlier. You can say the center, it could be nitrogen, and the other three are oxygen, hydrogen, and carbon. And in fact, if any of their position changes, that's how you change and you could be create or become ill in one respect or another. So we brought the knowledge back into it. We understand the structure of it. As we said, we understood how we could absorb carbon as a gas of a matter. And we understood very simply that how to use this knowledge, for example, to repair the neural system from diseases like MS. In the world of medicine, they say when the myelin gets damaged or is gone or is eroded, uh, the patient gets MS. But in fact, we have proven that MS only happens when the carbon within the amino acid changes its characteristics from a conductor to a resistor. So what was a insulation, it becomes a conductor. And this is actually one of the properties of carbon. Carbon is used in everyday life in the motors and generators as one of the best conductors as a brush. At the same time, diamond, which is again carbon in a different structure, lattice structure, is one of the best resistors known to man. So it's very simple. As a nuclear physicist, developing technology, understanding the gravitational positioning, understanding how CO2 can be made, or matter can be made in a, in a solid state, in the gases in the universe. So we tried it, we brought the knowledge, we instructed it through systems which we built, and we find people with MS who lost their feelings after five years, they start feeling their body again, they can feel their toes again, they can start moving and walking again, and this is part of the same progress. So, in reality, um, even as it was discussed, uh, vitamins are some sort of magnetic fields. Uh, all the minerals are some sort of magnetic fields which they can hold on to so they become uh, what they are and our bodies has got used to use certain amount of it or certain of them for certain operations within the body. So, well, um, so you say that we don't need those vitamins anymore, actually. We just need the, the, the right vibration or like... The no, we need the... It's not... It's not that we don't need vitamins. The point is that we, have, we are learning and then we are in a very... Um, fast way we are learning that we can replicate them as a plasma without actually them being as a solid matter for us to eat. It's the same thing as we've done very recently that we understanding the position, gravitational position, magnetic field positioning and being able to replicate it. Now we can make magnets out of anything. You can have a magnet, wood magnets that attracts only wood 
you can make magnets which only matter which attracts plastic and we've done the plastic uh, magnetic or uh, magnetizing as you call it in past two years it's very easy because now you create the right combination of what plastic is made you create the right exact copy of the magnetic field and gravitational field of the molecules of the plastic and that's it they get attracted to each other or they get repelled so it is very easy now to do as we offered the same to the Japanese with the Japanese nuclear disaster. We understand how this thing is done. We offered our technology to them. We offered it the following Sunday after the disaster that Keshe Foundation is prepared to give the system to them for retracting the radioactive material which is coming out of it back to the center of the reactor to be held there without polluting the environment. And uh, powers above had to give permission for such technology to be tested. So all of us are getting irradiated in a huge quantities. Even months after it, they have now made a no difference in it, but still the same uh, radiation damage is coming out of the center. And we can use the systems to do it. If you ask why, how is, why do you need such a thing, is that in a space is full of zones, full of radiation. And if we enter these radiations, we have two options. As the same as supplying food and medicine, we have to protect our aircrafts or crafts from these radiation zones. Or at certain points, we need to absorb certain radiations for production or for any other purposes. So we have developed now the technology that we can protect ourselves in deep space in high radiation zones. At the same time, we can use what we need in trips for what we need at a time of point of demand to absorb from the environment. It has a lot of applications. That one of the applications of this is poisoning. Now, if you have, let's say, rivers poisoned, you can create the gravitational field of the poison, and all you need, you can extract it from the water. So these are what is this technology to offer and what it's got to come. And this is one of the reasons that we have announced from April of 2012, we are setting up what we call the Cash Inter International Space Institute. We have approached the um, heads of Leuven University for accommodation. If they can provide that, we can collaborate with the university to set up this institute. We will accept 100 scientists from around the world to be trained and taught what we know that they can take it back to their own nations. So the process of teaching and learning and passing the knowledge on has already started. We shared our knowledge of space technology with Iran in 2008 and in 16th of March of 2011 they announced they have a spaceship program, first nation ever, because they have the knowledge, full knowledge has been transferred and the same will happen in the institute which hopefully the Belgium government officials will allow it to take place and will teach the same thing. The reason they call it the first nation which has got a spaceship program because it does not use propulsion anymore. Propulsion technology is finished. What the Americans use for sending a space, man to a space or the Russians, by burning fuel is what was brought in by the scientists from Germany from the Second World War to save their own lives. In reality, if you use the magnetic field and gravitational positioning, you don't need to burn anything, as I explained before. So the time of propulsion is over. The Americans know it. They've been, I've given lectures at George Hopkins University in 2010 uh, to their scientists. And it's very simple. They are seeing it. They understand what the changes is to, to come about. In the reality with using gravitational magnetic field is that the funny things we see at the moment with the Americans or the Russians that they train astronauts for years before they go up. They put them in a funny suit. They put them up and they're all floating in a, what do you call, weightlessness. This is all a game. In reality, if you look, a system like Earth, which creates its own magnetic field and gravitational field, it creates a specific condition that it keeps at 1G. So we can walk and live a normal life without floating. The same thing happened with us. We created in a, in a, a synthetic way when we go on a jumbo jet, so we travel with the jetliners. We don't go and get trained six months before how to get on a plane to go to, from one continent to another. 
because in the jet plane they create a pressure condition that it grips to near 1G, that will near, near enough. But if you understand the structure of magnetic and gravitational fields, how they are created, you can create zones and you decide how depth uh, the zone will be, 10 meters, 100 meters, 1000 meters, that 1G stays exactly like Earth. You keep 1G. So with our systems, even we are offered tickets to sell to Moon for 2016, we say if you want to test the weightlessness, you have to pay extra because it costs money to create that condition. In our systems, you always say 1G. The other advantage with this technology is the Americans are planning to go to Mars. If you've seen the program, advanced program, is that they are planning how to make a capsule or use a capsule that they can literally walk in this, uh, what I call a, a fuel tank for a few months because they can't, unless when they go out of it, they need to wear a special clothes to go on Mars or wherever they go. They are conditioned to what I call the prison, a capsule. Exactly what's happening in the space lab at the moment. But if you can create a magnetic field and gravitational field exactly like Earth the way we do, you can go in your Mini or your Mercedes or in a fuel tanker, doesn't matter. When you get to your destination, you increase your magnetic field 10 meter, 100 meter, exactly still at 1G. You can walk, you can walk on Moon, you can walk on Mars, you can walk on any planet, you can even walk in space at 1G. Because the magnetic field and gravitational field allows you to create a zone. When you finish, you reduce your field, you go to the next place. It's like a holiday camp, you can open tents anywhere you like. This is the future of this technology. We don't talk, these are not fairy tales because we have systems now. And very soon, as I showed you the CO2, as I showed you the, what do you call it, uh, the operation of the magnetic fields, we will show the first car which has no wheels and it positions itself on the same basis. You don't need to tank fuel anymore. You literally find your position, you don't have the wheels, you will fly at any height you like. But the advantage with this technology is that we have tested it, we can say it clearly, that because you create magnetic fields like atmosphere around your system, the heating which was like with Concorde, Concorde used to expand by a few centimeters because of the heat when it was called supersonic. So if you put this system inside, let's say, a jumbo jet, you can increase the boundary of the magnetic field beyond the physical boundary of the plane and then there will be no friction between the plane and the matter in the space or in the environment of the Earth. So you travel a friction-free environment so you can go much faster. But if, for example, you put this system inside the same plane, as the dynamic magnetic field of the system are operating, your system becomes invisible to the present knowledge radar technology, which means as the magnetic fields of the radio waves approach the system, as it's a plasma, a dynamic plasma, it literally absorbs it in and chucks it up and literally becomes part of its structure. So the wave from the radar never goes back. So while you see the object flying, the radar says there is no object existing because it doesn't get the feedback or the return wave. So these objects, once or any object, using this technology to the present radar frequency are invisible. So a lot of people will see them, they say there is such a thing in the sky and uh, radar a special says there is not because there is nothing on our radar, but there are ways of detecting in systems. So, but at the same time, because these systems create a dynamic, a spherical magnetic fields, these magnetic fields interact with the magnetic field and gravitational fields of the Earth. So the consequence of two fields interacting is creation of light. So most of the time from now on, when you see these systems flying in the sky, due to interaction of their magra, magnetic gravitational field, and the gravitational magnetic field of the Earth, you will see what we call bright lights in the sky. So, in the future, the way we see jet liners track in the sky, we know the plane has been there before, we see the, what we call the vapor lines. In the future, we only see light at the point where the object is. 
because when the object moves, the light goes. There is no uh, leftovers in a way. So, in reality, very soon, w the way we got used to seeing jetliners in space or in the space above us, very soon we get used to seeing lights, bright lights crossing over. That's exactly what we'll see what's happening. But this has brings us to another dimension of the use of this technology. And that is using these gravitational magnetic fields. At the moment, the speeds of Mach 1, Mach 2, Mach 3, which is used for missile technology and weapon technology, it becomes a child play. We have done a test and we can confidently say that using this technology, Mach 30 plus, Mach 40 plus, about 40 to 45 is the maximum within the Earth atmosphere. Why? Because if you go too fast and you cannot control, you usually zoom out of the atmosphere. So to be able to develop the control system within the Earth atmosphere, you can go about 30-35, Mach 35. In a way, this makes the present nuclear missile technology obsolete. You know, say, anyway, as we say, you send one with a missile of two, three thousand, a system which goes 35, what we sell, return to the center. This is very easy. So in a way, one of the applications of this technology will be bringing peace that no nation can use weapon technology against the other. But on the other hand, if you have it and you want to use it faster, everybody is the same position now. This brings another subject about how and where this technology is going to take us. Nobody knows where we're going to end up and how we're going to end up. But we know for fact one thing, we are in a position to show and demonstrate physical systems uh, to public in a very short time. We have shown the system to the government officials in Belgium. The scientific world in Belgium has seen the system, physical system, and its operation in some cases. And now we will show the whole system and its operation the way we have shown on our website how a woman using our technology with MS, after five years in a wheelchair and bed, she has started walking and she can feel her toes. And after four years of the last stage of MS, uh, she even gets her monthly menstruation back, which she lost four years ago when MS set in, which is one of the side effects of it. Through the understanding of this technology, we understand very clearly even what we see as the physical damages of MS, Parkinson, a stroke, is only 20% of the real damage. 80% of the damage is so internal and it comes in such a slow pace that most of the time the patient forgets. And as now they recover from these positions because the neural systems are coming back, everything which was lost is getting back to normal, they start telling us what they are gaining. They can feel their internal organs for the first time. They can feel their toes for the first time. They can remember, even they speak a language they didn't remember they spoke before. In a very recent case, we have a gentleman from Parkinson that uh, in his own native language, which is Flemish, he mumbles, he could not speak. But now he remembers that he speaks a very clear, it's all been recorded, he speaks a very clear English. The question came, how can he speak English? This gentleman, when he was young, he was a prisoner of German prison camps, and one of his best friends was an American. He learned English from the American guy in the Second World War, and he forgot about it. And now he speaks English fluently, just through the same process. These are the things we see an end to Alzheimer's disease. Alzheimer's has become English for us a history. We are using this technology at the moment on the trial cases for people who've been damaged by chemotherapy. What the doctors don't tell you, and the pharmaceuticals don't tell you, uh, statistically, and all the numbers are available, one can check, is that a large percentage, over three quarters of people who get chemotherapy after age of 60, 65, within five to seven years can't die of the most little niggly infections, because the body hasn't got the immune system to protect the body. The body has lost it because of the chemotherapy years ahead. So in North America, in Canada, they give them injections to increase this immune system for a little bit longer they can live. So we are running trials in Canada where a person in this condition is using the technology and we start seeing the change in bone marrow. 
we start hopefully seeing everything. And what we do, we always rely on the, not what we say, but the physical blood test and collaboration with other scientists. So we see the changes. We have seen a very recent past, a woman who's been in bed for five years, after eight weeks she can sit up and actually try to walk. We have shown this video in past seven days in our lectures. This is what is to come. This is the changes of this technology. In a way, the society will change one way or another. We have seen changes in the small measures over centuries. We moved from a donkey to finding out about the wheels. <clears throat> they say the wheel was the biggest invention of man. It made us independent of the animals. Then we found out about the steam and water. And then we found about the electricity was another change, the society changed totally. In um, mid, late, 20th century, we found the computer. They said everybody's going to lose their job because of the computer. Now there are more employed people through computer and computer programming than anything else. This is a phase. You can put any obstacles, any objections to it, but now the cat is out of the bag. There is no way it can be stopped. The, the reason the cat is out of the bag is certain things. First of all, um, as I said to the Americans and the Canadians, I said, the problem with you, you captured me too late on board of a plane. They literally walked on the board of a plane. They were waiting with all my documents in their hand. It wasn't quite so. They, were, they knew I received my visa to go to Mexico less than 24 hours before. And the officer who came on board to get me, he said, I've been studying your case for three days to be a nuclear physicist to speak to you on, a, on your level. So they know what's coming out, what is about to come. But the thing is, as I tell them, as I told the Canadian, what do you call it, officials, is that the problem with you is you left me too long free to publish too many books, to put too many patents which are published, to write too many scientific papers, and to talk to too many government officials and scientists and teach them. So the time of trying and stopping the change is too late. We have treated too many people in Europe that they've seen the alternatives. We have given so many lectures. On average, I lecture to about two to three hundred people, maybe sometimes more, every couple of weeks. So the knowledge is passed on, and Cash Foundation is growing within the people, amongst the people in Western Europe. People who've seen the effects of the technology through their own brothers, to their own themselves being treated. Most of the people who work with Cash Foundation are the people who've been sick themselves. And they've seen, uh, we have a gentleman who's been not be able to work for 15 years, and within three days from start using the technology, the guy cannot stop working. He's working seven days a week. And this is the same. A man or woman who's, who could not do something, now she can do a seven days work. So they're putting their feeling back, they're supporting the foundation and teaching, and allows us to teach. So it's not that it's going to be a change, what's going to happen. The change will come. One day the oil will run out, not in the next 20 years, in 50 years. So there is no, there is no uh, reason why, why not now. This is the question which we were asking when I was invited to come to Belgium first. Anybody who we talk to say, why Belgium? Why do Belgians put themselves so down that why not Belgium? And as we said in very recent talk, the launch of the first uh, um, what we call gravitational field by Cash Foundation will be done from Belgium. You can go to New York from Brussels within two to five minutes. And most of this five minutes is actually uh, landing and getting up. And the same you can go from Brussels to Tokyo within less than 10 minutes. So the time and the space and the nationalism is totally finished. So doesn't matter where we develop this technology, where it comes out, which part of it comes out from which country is totally irrelevant because now we all as a human race are going to be benefited by it. We are all going to have not a free energy, but energy as we need to the amount we need. No more abuses of the uh, environment to burn so much fuel to damage the environment and no much so much exploring the land and uh, doing all sorts of use of the fertilizers to destroy that for the next generation we are running into problem with even with the air we breathe. 
So this is what's going to happen. This is what a lot of people say what we've been waiting for. But now that it's here, they can't believe it is here. So it's just a mindset. And it, the way it's coming out, the way we are selling books throughout the world, through our internet system, we see that everybody, we are even selling our energy system is bought in Hong Kong and in China. And this is very interesting. So we sell it as much to South America as to European countries and everywhere else they are putting the deposit to receive the energy system. On the other hand, a lot of people talk about the free energy. There is no free energy. The only thing is that, as I explained at the beginning, we go to the source of the atom, the plasma, and we go to the source of the plasma, which is what we call principal uh, matter or principal magnetic fields, which is this magnetic field is there for 10, 15 billion years. So what we do, we go to the center, we use it for five or 10,000 years. That's why instead of for the atom to unwind itself over billions of years, we allow it to unwind in 10,000 years. So that extra energy is what we receive. It's nothing is free. We just learn how to speed it up and use what we, we, what we like. So what they call, we're going to have a free energy. There is no free. We're still using magnetic fields of the matter. But if you go into uh, principal matter and what the, a lot of people now talk about, the dark matter and dark energy, this is very interesting. We call it the transition energy. We call it the transition matter. And why transition? Because all it is is from a point of the strong magnetic field to get to the point of where it becomes tangible, it needs a transition time, it needs a time to arrive. So magnetic field in motion, this is what I call energy. So that motion from the strong field of the source to where we are, it cannot go on its own. It needs time, it needs a space of where it's going through, and that we call the transition energy. Why is transition? It's because it's a transit. And they call this dark energy because they couldn't understand it. Now we understand what it is, we can explain it. And in the book I've explained what's the difference between a light and an atom, or a proton or electron. So it's very easy to understand the whole concept because we go back to the origin of the creation and we can explain and control everything from the top to where it becomes matter which is important to us as a human. And this, what is matter to us, not necessarily is matter to the other creatures which are in the universe. So we are part of a, a, a chain of events. Yeah, but in a way, this is the most beautiful invention ever for mankind. Is this a beautiful invention for mankind? Depends how mankind uses it. It's very much, it's a sword which cuts both ways. As I explained to you, I can use a magnetic field to travel to deep space in minutes, or I can use the same magnetic field to commit the most horrendous crime, which is dilute your body within the field. As I said to the National Security Officers of Belgium some time ago, with the present guns, because they in the talk they were carrying revolvers when we were talking, I said to them, at the present, when you shoot somebody with a revolver or a gun, there is a body you can relate to who shot who. With this technology, when you release the magnetic field of the principle hitting a matter, is what I said to you about the earth hitting the sun, there will be nothing left of you to know who was there. How are we going to use this? Into what advantage and to what, who, whose advantage? And who can control who? Or, as the knowledge has been well published and released within the public, if you have an internet, you can educate yourself, but if you understand it, you can build the systems, is that nobody can abuse nobody anymore. And no nation can run another nation for raw material. Because with this technology, I've done it before, you can make as much as any raw material as you like. Because everything is within the hand of the system and capability of the system to do. Very recently, we had a discussion, we're still discussing, with people in Saudi Arabia. If they listen to this interview, they know who they are. In Saudi Arabia, there is a huge problem with drinking water. So they have what they call desalination units, which is they clean the water from the sea, they take the salt away. And in places like 
Jada or in the inner cities within a country, they go for a deep water. Deep water is getting to a point of they're going a deeper, and if it's happening in Texas as well, in Texas they've taken their, their water, but it's going lower because they use all the water they could get to, and they're going lower and lower. Understand exactly how the energy is produced in this system. This is what I said, using the principal matter to matter level. We can create a lot of free, or what we call available energy. If you've done your work in the school, in the chemistry lab, when you boil water, when it cools down, it becomes water, liquid. And that's what it is, evaporation. You evaporate it, you distill it. That's how they make alcohol. In our systems, we can create enough energy to create a cold condition compared to its environment that the moisture within the air becomes liquid water. So, in reality, we don't need to wait anymore for the clouds to rain, to go in the ground and go under the ground for us to be able to have drinking water. We created drinking water from the environment which we live in. And that's the beauty of it. Which means there is no more pressure on man in deserts to be dying of thirst. You give a system and the system can create as much water as you like from the moisture within the air of the atmosphere. The driest space in the, on Earth carries 15% moisture of water. In European countries, we are over 50%. So if you can extract or suck in, let's say, one ton of air, you can get at least 100, 200, 300 liters of water out of it. So in a way, we should not see the disasters of Africa at the moment, which are thousands who are dying of without, because of droughts. Cash Foundation is running a trial called the SEED experiment. We have tested it in seven countries at the moment running, where we coat the seed with the structure of the same material as our reactor, but in a nano state, where the seed is taking moisture from air and is growing as one of the people who run the experiment is a wild grow. He was away from home. So he, we asked what's the condition with your, what the seeds run, you're running in the United States. And he said, they're growing like wild. I had to call my wife and my wife says, these are growing like wild things. So we see the whole application of the technology. There should be no need for anybody to die of hunger. We have run tests in Belgium, especially like the woman I told you within, she's been in bed for five years and now she starts sitting on the bed. She, the carers who look after her from whole day while the husband is away from eight o'clock till four o'clock in the afternoon, they say she does not eat, she used to eat a lot. Now she's very little. I said, yes, because most of the energy she needs are within the cups which we feed her. And she, the body's taking what they need so she doesn't need to consume anymore. So the same principle applies to this water. We can put what man needs within the structure of the water, the way we help people to reprocess their body, to feed them. So in Africa, when you get a moisture, when there's a drought, you get the moisture, you change it to water, you can add within the same process what energy the man needs to eat, so the water becomes the feeding process. So nobody needs to die of hunger and nobody needs to die of a drought, and there is no need for crops of the um, chain food supply. These are the changes to come, and this is, it, it will become a shock, but once the shock settles in, and people start producing the same thing, the same process, the abuses of the past will change, at the same time man will take what he needs. The way we are abusing our environment will come to an end. Uh, we were talking about the creation. Uh, if people understand the concept of gravitational field and magnetic field, people will come to understand how closely we are related to each other as a human being, and how we live on each other's for even survival. What you breathe, I breathe. What I uh, what I breathe out, you breathe in. You take part of my energy, you take part of my cell, you take part of the, the energy, the magnetic fields, which are in move from me. So in a way, as a human being, we all need each other to survive. And in the Keshe Foundation, we talk about the capturing this energy in the space, that we don't need any food. 
when we proposed this, they said this is a crazy thing. So, um, in one of the interviews and one of the experimental lab experiments, one of the journalists said, okay, can you then, when he saw the production of CO2 from fresh air, we literally take CO2 from air and we, we produce a solid CO2. And we showed him how it can be done while they were running the lab, the engineers were running the test. He said, can you make a torch which can run on water? Then nowhere in the universe we need any more batteries, we can't rely on the batteries. Uh, a few days later I called him and I said, uh, I've made a torch which works out of the magnetic field of the universe. You don't need the water. Anywhere in the universe you can absorb the smallest magnetic field, the smallest radiation, convert it into light and you know the way the light comes in and it comes absorbed by different animals, it becomes grass and minerals or vitamins and we eat it. So I give you the light, then you can decide what you want to make out of the light. And in a way, Instead of making a torch which works out of the water, with water, we developed a technology where exactly what I told you. In deep space, we need to absorb the smallest amount of energy in fragments, store it here in a capacitor, and in a very simple way. This could be, in a way, this light, ray of light, is part of the energy between us which is sitting in this room. So. The advancement is very much on the line of understanding how creation is and where we come to end up as a creation. So this system has no battery, it's been running for nearly over two years now. We have run it, we can run it for months and months, we've done it, we got fed up, we switched it up because we wanted to show people what it is. And it has no battery, it's literally a hollow system. But the structure, the way we explain of magnetic field and gravitational field, understood so we can repeat this we've got two or three torches like this running at the moment just to show in space we do not need to take even anything with us except absor even absorbing what is in the space to create as much food and energy in the space without relying on the mother planet earth so this brings us back to another position and that is what's the purpose of our creation why are we being created and this I have explained in a book <coughs> to be published late this year or beginning of next year. It's called Universal Order of Creation. And in this book I explain how creation is done, how we are created, and how our creation ends up with the existence of the soul and the soul of the man or the soul of anything. As long as you have a combination of magnetic fields which I can make a decision about the existence of the matters and the fields within them, you have a right of intelligence. You can think, you can decide. It does not need the physical body, the way we are used to, to hands and arms and legs. In a way, if you can communicate like the cells do, you don't actually need arms and legs. You need energy to survive of water. You create a magnetic field of the water within your body, so you absorb the amount of moisture you need. This is what our systems do. It's the same way goes with how the body will interact, how the beings will interact in the future, with what is another levels of non-tangible lives within the universe. We are used to tangibility, then we can confirm its existence. As one guy said to me, when the news in CNN, I believe it. So uh, in the space there are no CNN, so we have to see, and when we come across intelligence of a uh, non-physical way, but they can still interact with us. These are the consequences of interaction of the fields which leads to creation of an atom, which leads to creation of the cell, which leads to creation of intelligence. So, in so many ways we are not the only ones. We cannot be the only ones because once you understand the structure of the universe, we are part of a bigger structure. And even in the book which is getting published very soon in September of 2011, called the uh, creation of universe. In this book I explain even this universe which we live in is itself by law of physics is like a, a neutron which splits into an electron and a proton and makes an atom. 
this universe is created out of a split of another universe because the law of physics are continuous and similar in all dimensions. So what they call a Big Bang theory is nothing but actually a Big Bang rubbish. We are created through the same process. This universe is created through the same process of splitting of a bigger, more massive, and in time when this universe cannot hold on to its magnetic field and gravitational field, like exactly a neutron, we will split two further universes with uh, two split masses. So we are part of a chain of what we call unicos, universe, universe of, or universe in cosmos. And in reality, we can show the process, and we are part of it. And in a way, if you understand the use of the, the structure of uh, what we call principle matter and principle energy, what they call dark matter, dark energy, the way we use, crossing the space of the universe is a matter of seconds to the human life in a very short time. You are protected, but this time, for the first time, when you have a planet like Earth, what gives this magnetic field and gravitational field is given at its birth. It's constant, it cannot change. But with our systems, we can change it. So we can change the strength from matter to what they call transition matter or to what we call the principal matter strength. So with a higher strength, you can travel the space in a much faster, at the same time with a full protection and with a gravitational field. In the book, I've explained in a very simple way that you say, a uh, matter what happens to me when I go into an antimatter environment, or what you call what we call principal matter, or what you call a dark energy, and I we call it a transition energy. In the book, The Structure of Light, I've explained that our body will change in time to the environment which is in, which means when we go into the dimension of matter, or dark matter, or what you call it transition matter, or principal matter, what you call antimatter, because our cells are made of this and what we call principal matter in the center, as it slows down in the strength and becomes a matter, then in those environments the antimatter or principal matter will come forward. So we keep the integrity of our existence as it is, but instead of using our matter level, we use our or our body will change to uh, its principal matter level. So in different dimensions of the universe magnetic field, different strength within our structure will come forward. And in a way, uh, Einstein says, uh, light is energy. In fact, this is nothing but a load of uh, nonsense. Because light is a plasma. It's exactly the way the structure of a neutron, a neutron or a proton or electron. The only difference is that for a plasma of neutron, for example, to travel from A to B in a space, if it, stay, if it keeps its spherical shape as it is, it meets a lot of resistance. What it does as it tunes its magnetic field to point of its destination, wherever it could be, it becomes elongated. So, in fact, light is a plasma, but in an elongated shape, which in every environment which it goes through, it changes its cover, its jacket, according to its environment. When it's in the, a strong uh, principal environment, this principal field comes out because it loses less energy. There is less friction when you are the same. So the principle of what they say, uh, light, yes, there is a light in the dimension of the uh, transition matter, there is a light in the principal matter, but in that field, the strength and the light is due to the friction of the two plasma of the light against this environment. So there is a lot of answers in the world of physics we can now scientifically explain because we understand the creation of principal matter and dark matter. And at the same time, we can understand the creation of the soul and what's the problem or what is the purpose of creation and how we have a soul. The soul is very simple, I've explained in the book, which is to be published, the creation of universe, that the soul is like a ray of light we see from a star in the sky. Probably the star has died and been destroyed, has been absorbed as part of other pieces in the universe millions and millions of years ago. 
but its light still is in trouble to distribute, to participate in the structure of the universe to its balance. So, the soul of the man does not need the body of the man to exist. So, it's very simple to understand how and where we go with our souls and the structure of our souls. No, 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 I'm not God. It's just that we understand the process of creation. That is the difference. We understand and we go to the basics of the creation at any point in the universe. You don't need to be God. Because the fields are there, and one way or another, if you give it the right environment and give it the right magnetic field and gravitational field uh, appropriate for a certain type of fields to exist, you will have matter in the universe according to your own magnetic gravitational field. Why do we see light at this frequency? It's not because the light appears at this frequency. It appears because our amino acid magnetic gravitational field allows us to see the light at this frequency. So, if we had, for example, in the of nitrogen, pro uh, let's say, potassium in our chain of blood, in our molecule, amino acid, we would see a different light in different strength and different magnet, uh, uh, spectrum of the magnetic field. Mm -hmm. So, it's condition-based. So, once you understand this, you don't need to be God. You, are part, you understand the whole process of the creation. To people look, this is strange because we've been brought up over centuries um, the way uh, mysticism started. It's very simple. It's exactly like uh, why when we say we can travel with much faster speed than the speed of present aircrafts or propulsion, people look at us with a strange way. A very simple way. It's a mindset. Our ancestors came out of the sea or whatever. The only thing they could see was the birds. They were going faster. They thought that if they could fly like a bird, they can go faster with less time. So, for centuries, we worked to make a bird. The people made a wing, they jumped, they did everything. Till we managed to put a motor on it. So, in fact, our planes are a replication of uh, birds flying, but with motors on them. Now we put the jets on them. And then it came to the propulsion. The propulsion system is nothing new. Americans tried to glorify it. 700 years ago, 800 years ago, Chinese made the first rockets out of their firework. All they've done, they made a bigger tank. If we didn't have the Chinese, and if we didn't have the birds to look, and we are a human being, we got the intelligence, we see things moving, we want to understand what do we see moves. We see the moon moves, we see the sun moves, we see other things in the universe move. And if we understand their structure, how they move in the universe, then you come to the same conclusion as I have. All you need, you have to make yourself the bird, make a copy of the earth, that's what we've done. And that's why our system looks strange. So, we had copied the way Earth works in our system, because we have full data of what, uh, what the inner structure of the Earth is, and that's why it looks we do a strange thing. So, if we didn't have the birds and we didn't have the Chinese, and we have the amount of intelligence we have, we would have come to the same conclusion as I have centuries and thousands of years ago. A lot of things go as I explained. Man did not discover gravity and magnetic field at the same time. If we would have discovered the two together, and we understand it's the simplicity of the same, as I said, magnet, north and south, do we call it gravity. Gravity means gravitation, getting pulled. And north and south pulls. The same thing, so north, north and north, replay, uh, what do you call it, repulse. So if we would have understood the two together, we most probably would have been a totally different race, would have been much most probably the other side of the universe by now into other universes. But we need the time, and the, the thing is, even this time is not time for man to understand this technology because the man still kills for his own ego. When the man learns he can live at peace, then the time will come when the man is time to mature enough to go to the next step. And this is what I said in one of my books, it's one, it's one of the books that's written, is that in time, if man goes with this attitude of war and killing into space, and comes across the other creatures which have much more advanced knowledge of the creation, uh, they will not allow to be carried on with this technology, with this, this killing and destruction. They will be taught a lesson that they will never forget, and they will forget about what they have been brought up to kill to survive.
and uh, what do you feel the near future will bring us? Within the next 10 to 15 years, we'll cross the solar cell, solar system. Within the next three to five years, most probably, we brought our technology so advanced. Crossing galaxies within the next 10 years will be a very high possibility because now once you open the Pandora box, everything else has been seen very easy to be done. And then the universe is the same dimension. It's, it's very interesting when you say what I see of the future. There is a, a, a very stupid concept in uh, astronomy. They say Venus is the only planet in solar system which goes clockwise. Yeah? And this comes from ignorance of the man, the way they used to think that Earth is the center of the universe. They say, at the moment, cosmologists and astronomers say, is that the Venus has been hit in its life by a meteorite that has caused the reverse of its rotation. This is nothing but the rubbish. Because why? We understand the concept of the rotation and magnetic field and gravitational field. We created, we developed a, technology, a system to, to prove the concept. And it's very easy. In our system, our reactor magnetic field goes exactly like Earth, anti-clockwise. If we change one of the fields of strength or change the position in respect to other fields slightly, the reactor starts vibrating and then it starts going clockwise. So no meteorite has ever hit the Venus. The only thing is, in Venus, there are two possibilities. In this inner core, the magnetic fields are positioned slightly different, or one of them is moving much faster than the other one, and that's why it's going the other way. The other possibility is, as is in the book which I explained about the creation of solar systems, all the planets are moving in sequence. It means as the big giant planets we see as gas planets at the end, they become closer to the sun because the gravitational field of the sun is pulling them in. As you come to a certain position, then our rotation will change in respect because the, Earth is, the Sun has got a much stronger gravitational field and a higher rotation. Then Earth, as Venus moves in closer to be absorbed by the Sun, Earth moves to take the position of Venus, we start going clockwise. And we can show it physically. So the mystery of Venus being hit by a meteorite is nonsense. It's the same with the rotation of uh, Uranus. Uranus is the only planet which works on its vertical axis, and all its moons go on, uh, around its vertical axis, where on Earth we go on the uh, other axis. Yeah, we have a system, and we show exactly how. If you change one more parameter, the system to find the stability moves sideways. So, what hit Venus, uh, Uranus? There was no other meteorite, and these are huge gaseous planets. Even in the book, with a paper which is getting published in the book, which is coming out, the creation of solar system. We explain exactly how the ring of Saturns are created, the reason, because we have a system, we can show it how it's done, and how all the gaseous planets have rings. Because it's part of characteristics of their creation, that they have the rings. And part of this has already been explained in the second book, which is the structure of the light. So, in so many ways, uh, as our knowledge about the reality of positioning and magnetic field interaction in the universe increases, then a lot of things which our forefathers made up to convince themselves, as they say, the magnetic field of the Earth is because of the solid core in the middle and the convection theory that the electrons are freed and then they interact with the rotation of the center uh, solid core and it creates the magnetic field of the Earth. Uh, it's been proven to be totally rubbish because now we know the solid core is not solid core, there is got another core inside it. And now we have two magnetic fields and we understand how gravity is and our system is a copy of it. If you read my books, I explain this fully in it. So these are because at that time in the 19th, 20th century, they understood the concept of dynamo. So they thought the Earth is like a dynamo. But in fact, in nuclear plasma physics, as a nuclear physicist, we know plasma, which is itself magnetic fields in motion, creates its own current. And the current is the rate of movement of magnetic fields, how much they move. So that leads to creation of magnetic field itself. So in a way, magnetic fields, their motion creates its own magnetic field, 
which feeds the universe. So you don't need that much material. The concept that the center of the Earth is a solid matter is totally meaningless because it's plasma, it's certain amount of plasma, and its motion creates a second magnetic field inside. The solid core and what we knew is created on the other side is still a plasma. The two fields interact and goes back again to what we said. The two sides which interact, they create the gravity, and the two sides which are similar, they repel, they create the magnetic field of the Earth. So in a way, once you understand this, crossing uh, galaxies and universes will be a matter of next 10, 15, 20 years, and no more. The reason to explore, and if we have everything, is that we are human race. We always wanted to know what's next door. When they found America, we all went there to see how America is. And we, that's why we started from one position in the universe, on Earth, and we moved further and further and further to find a better land next door. It's part of our nature to expand and find out what the universe carries. But on the other hand, as I always say in all my talks, what we have discovered and what we have we are developing is a knowledge like a house with a thousand steps to get to the top. With everything which we've done in past 30, 40 years, with everything which we were developing so rapidly in past five years, we haven't even gotten to step one yet. We're getting ready to get up to before even we walk yet. Let alone putting in the first step on the on the first step of the ladder of thousand steps. So there is a lot more. It's just that putting the foundation the right way, the correct way, and the way that brings peace to man. With this technology there can't be any more war. Because I have as much knowledge as you have, and at the same time, I can dissolve you that you become nothing. And I always said in my letter to United Nations and US House of Justice, I have said very clearly, the man will come to accept this technology not out of love, but out of the fear of his own existence. We won't love this technology, but we will. We will take it because I know what they'll do with us. There'll be none of us left. There'll be no man left. Why? Because we can literally bring back ourselves to the point of nonness, nothingness. There's never been a Big Bang. If you understand the process of the creation, uh, this theory of a stupidity of whoever came up with the Big Bang theory, when a proton divides into electron and proton, there is no Big Bang. It's just a whoosh, and the plasma splits. Huh? Whoever has been coming up with this creation of huge Big Bang and then they created, and there is a stupid logic of uh, when the universe cooled down, the gravity it got hold, then atoms were created. This is a total nonsense. This is the guys who don't understand nothing about physics. In physics, well, the, well, now we understand the structure of plasma. When the plasma slows down, it comes to a matter level, it becomes tangible to us. So there was never a Big Bang and there was never cooling. And the actual, the universe is, they said the universe is expanding. The universe is expanding because the principal matter is in the center, and as it is unwinding, it is growing itself. And the reality is that what we call the unicos, the universal cosmos, is that if there wasn't a room for this universe to expand into, this universe would not expand it. So there is another part to this universe which is beyond our knowledge of what we can see. So this universe is expanding into an environment that that environment allows it to expand into. And when that environment does not allow the expansion anymore or takes it more than it needs this universe, it leaks like exactly the solar system. The rays goes out, this universe will divide and become two other universes. And there will never be a Big Bang. It's always like we see it exactly like a division of neutron into splitting, and it's just a whoosh, and it starts from the center, and you see the structure. So, there's a lot of theory about uh, the same with the black hole, creation of black hole. There's no black hole. Black hole is just because the center is so intense, principal matter, as it crosses to a transition matter, 
it creates a balanced field that you, there is no light created. When two things are similar, they don't create any friction or very little friction. And that's why they call it the dark. That's why the space is dark. Because the fields in the space are of the same strength, more or less, because they're traveling, they're transiting to each other. So we don't see light. In reality, when there is too much of friction, we see the light. That's why we have, when the rays of the sun come and they f interact with the uh, magnetic field of the earth, it creates a friction, which gives us the light. If this was the case, why do we have the dark? Because there is no ray at interacting with the magnetic field of the earth. This is the same reason we have day and night. Who is behind it from the direction of the sun is in dark because there is not enough ray comes to interact with the magrav magnetic field and gravitational field of the earth together. And the magnetic field and gravitational field of the earth decides how much of the field of the sun we attract except when you get explosions of matters. It's the same thing, it's all explained in the books of published and to be published by within the next few weeks and months. I walked out of Africa for years and I've seen people who have nothing, they just have, they take the, uh, literally the syrup from the palm tree and they, that's their food. They share it with others and they're happy people, they're always dancing and singing. And I've seen people who have three, four Rose Roses Park outside their house, they got multi millions and billions and they still want more and nothing is good enough and nobody is good enough. So, happiness is a state of mind and the greed of the man. More and more people are becoming conscious of they can't take whatever they like. They have to put something back in the society. The, the, the new generation, by watching and being aware of, are more or less self-regulating themselves. Themselves in what, how much they take. We see a lot of people wanting to become vegetarians because not to hurt animals. But in fact, even the vegetable has a soul, if you understand the structure of the living. So, in so many ways, we start regulating ourselves for two reasons. First of all, the greed is finding its own limit. And secondly, we're getting so much that we cannot handle. But at the same time, it's part of progress of human being. That's why we are so successful and we discover and we live in such a, such a life at the moment. Because we want, we look for to achieve what we don't have. It's the same why we go to space, because we want to be there. And we find the tools for it. Unfortunately, the space technology has been hijacked by one of the most, uh, uh, what I call, unhuman person in the world. Uh, Mr. Van Brown, as we know now the files of the Second World War has opened up. No man has committed more murder than this gentleman. Even the Americans don't want to speak to him as, as part of their space technology. To save his life, he diverted the whole knowledge of man towards his way to save his own meager life. And he brought to the propulsion. And the same with the scientists who went to Russia from, from the Second World War. So now they opened the Second World War books and we know he's been he is personally responsible for 25,000 deaths in the caves they found within the, behind the uh, U-2 test sites, which he signed for. So, a lot of things has led us to this point, and hopefully in the future it will not. I hope, uh, as I always say, my technology will not harm a single soul. As you know, uh, the Cash Foundation, uh, after I die, goes back to two organizations. Uh, half goes to the United Nations, and half goes to the Universal House of Justice in Israel, which is the religion which I believe in. And it bases on unifying all the religions. So, uh, at the end of the day, the politicians and the, uh, the man of any religion, you being Christian, Buddhist, a Muslim, Christian, Jew, uh, we all will come to uh, work through and with each other to achieve uh, the peaceful man. So the United Nations will not stay the way it is as it's been used by as an exclusive club for murdering and destroying other nations 
under cover of uh, uh, justice. Uh, United Nations will serve, come to serve man as one piece and one unit, not for the present man. When we go to space, we need to speak at one language from people of the earth, and the United Nations will be the, like uh, the council, which will do all the negotiations and procedures which to be set up. As I said, I know what's to come, but human race is not ready yet to understand. What is to come? Oh, a lot of things. We, is, we are going literally from the time we went from Europe to America. We thought we found a new land and there is nobody there. As we went to America and we came across the Red Indians and different type of Red Indians, we had to negotiate with different chiefs. And it will be the same when we go to space. When we come to new places, there will be different creatures, not necessarily physical the way we see them, but there will be men of intelligence or livings of intelligence. We have to negotiate and that negotiation and all of it on behalf of the rest of the human race or the blue planet will be done by United Nations. This Mickey Mouse game of abuse of uh, power for certain people to please their own pocket will finish very soon because everybody will have as much as everybody else and everybody can do what everybody else can do. So equality will come very much faster than other people think. Because I can build the same house as anybody else and I can have whatever luxury is in it the same as anybody else. So the agreed time will go at the same time when man goes to space they realize how feeble they've been fighting for nothing. Because there's much more in the universe for man to enjoy than a brick and mortar which they put together and call it their own. In so many ways, there is a lot of uh, uh, talk about um, UFOs and other things, which I don't believe in it, uh, because uh, it's not UFO, it's not unidentified. With the technology which I have developed and the way we've seen we operate when we turn our systems on, we see the glowing of the system, exactly like a, uh, what we call a bright light. So. Uh, whoever we call UFOs, they are not UFOs, they are people who came to understand the structure of working of a universe and use the same system as now we use. Their system has a gravitational and a magnetic field and the interaction system with our atmosphere creates a light. Once you go out of this um, atmosphere, you, the interaction is much weaker, you don't see it, it's, you work in the same level. So, uh, we ourselves soon become a UFO to somebody else because the knowledge is here I mean in the next 10 years we are the aliens of the other planets as as they are they are exploring to find out about the rest of the universe we will explore this in the next five to ten years so um, I've seen some structures in the pictures people show um, you can explain the systems could be real because if you use a uh, magnetic gravitational system and you understand the way mm, you need systems to move in different directions you will understand why the structures are and the way they are. As I said in our uh, first trials in Tehran thanks to the government of Iran um, we achieved a vertical lift. Vertical lift is very easy because once you create a magnetic field and gravitational field against the Earth, it just pushes you up or you move it slightly in one direction. But it took further research and development to actually find the technology to be able to move in every direction. And that's why we offered, as we go back to the beginning of this talk, our technology to NASA and the Russian Space Agency if they want and if there's a problem in the space with the people in the space lab. We are prepared and we are getting ourselves ready for November if uh, any time. They cannot feed or reach supply to them. We are prepared to take that action. And I'm sure um, the Iranian government is in the same position. Uh, and if need be that we have to return them, we are getting ourselves prepared. The technology is not a technology. The systems are there. We have to bring our development within the next few months very quick, quickly into operation and every effort has been made to do to get to that point. Even today the preliminary stages have been put into action. People talk about this is a fairy tale, 
to them might be, to us it's a reality. We are, we're already working on the machines that doesn't need the wheels and the moves on its own because we understand the directional motion, how to move back, forward and sideways. We don't need propulsion. Initially we thought we lift, we create a lift and then we use the energy of the system to literally lose like a propulsion to blow ourselves the direction we want to go. But now understanding the constant of motion in any direction, we don't need that kind of things either. So sooner or later, uh, we become ourselves bright lights in the sky for ourselves on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. And uh, I regret that I misused, abused the word UFO, meaning unidentified flying objects, by which I mean that the objects that we see could be identified. So it are, for instance, maybe extraterrestrial vehicles. They are, they are like us going from, let's say, Europe into Africa with our modern cars, where they are used to donkeys and camels or elephants. Just because we have a little bit more knowledge and we have got a little bit more advanced, it doesn't mean we are any different than the people in those countries. We are all the same blood and the same flesh. And it's the same with the people who, what you might call slash, uh, extra uh, UFOs or whatever they call them. These, if there are such a thing, which are, there is no if about it. It's just that this level of life has reached to where we are now in past four or five years with this new technology. So we have to, a lot to learn. And the basis of learning it and using it is to be used on a peaceful way. Man has changed his habits. Once we change the habits, then we find out uh, a lot of things will open up for us. This, this scene has to be set by the governments. The governments have to change the attitude of uh, what I call raping and uh, uh, what I call destroying other nations to feed their own people. Nation, the governments have to learn to share and to be there to support the real way, not to rob the way it's been done for past centuries. And in a way, uh, as I was giving a talk to uh, the scientists from IMAC, the Nano Institute in Belgium years ago, um, the, one of the people present, the scientist and the financier, said, the problem with you is that you write your books in such a simple language that everybody understands. Your papers has to be in a very complicated scientific way. And I said to him, I write my books in a way that a white man sitting across the table from me calling him professor, and a black man in the Bank of Jungles of South Africa will have the same understanding and can do the same thing that one cannot abuse the other. Mm -hmm. He got upset and he left the room. So, and they said, IMAC is not prepared to collaborate because I was too straightforward. So at the moment, according to what we have, our technology is about 100 to 150 years ahead of IMAC, according to the people inside IMAC. So I think IMAC can close their doors or join us to bring a peaceful process in the program. And how happy are you as a person to be able to play that magnificent role and sharing that? There is no role to play, it's just a matter of transferring knowledge. There are a lot of scientists who work on the same basis and they see what we do and they are copying it, they are, they are doing it. I've been to China, I've been to Korea. I have uh, spoken to the scientists from different parts of Europe. Um, very interesting point uh, is I was talking to the top man in NASA years ago. And I remember the position. I was standing outside, nearly outside the central station in Antwerp. It goes back to 2004 or 5. And he said to me, Mr. Kesh, we have a problem. The problem is, if we accept your technology, which we know is correct, what are we going to do with the 7,000 propulsion scientists in propulsion lab in NASA? So we have to block you GPR. to guarantee the jobs. Jet yeah, JPR, Jet Propulsion. Boys from NASA know me very well, even the astronauts, who I speak to them on the personal line, private line. They know what is to come, they know what is sits there. It's just a matter of who's prepared to make the first move. And thanks to the Iranian government, they made the first move. And then they have a, they have a, 
a spaceship program. The spaceship program is part of not using propulsion and using uh, gravitational positioning because you don't need to burn any fuel and it's much easier to travel faster. This brings back a lot of, as I said, um, when your missiles are Mach 2, Mach 3 and you can go Mach 35. As one of our guys says in um, Cash Foundation says, return to the sender. Whoever sends a nuclear bomb out will receive it back much faster. I wonder who's going to be prepared to test it the first time. And on the other hand, uh, at the present time, we're all getting irradiated very heavily, as we know because of the Japanese situation. And this technology can help to absorb most of the radiation, at least from the atmosphere, that our next generation are not born defects. This again shows the greed of people, where the technology is available and we can stop a lot of it. But uh, at the moment, certain um, people for their own pockets, they think they're very clever. But the strange thing enough is that their own children and their own blood is getting infected by the same radiation. So in a way, they are destroying their own roots.